first of all, welcome to How the Light Gets In Festival. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. You started out as a practicing psychotherapist and then you switched to philosophy. What made you shift careers? Um, I'm not sure if I ever actually took a decision to shift careers. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not practicing um, uh, anymore since I started my PhD. Um, but in some way, um, psychoanalysis or psychotherapy has always been in the background yeah. of, the, of my philosophy work. Yeah, so I work on the philosophy of psychoanalysis, um, both, both in forms. So philosophy informs my thinking of, of psychotherapy and psychotherapy and my history in psychotherapy, but also my um, reading of, especially Freud and Lacan, inform my understanding of um, issues in philosophy. And of course, there are a few other philosophers whose work sort of spans both fields. Two people come to mind, Jonathan Lear, uh, Cornelius Castoriadis, another Greek philosopher. Apart from there being sort of philosophical questions around psychoanalysis, is there a sort of deeper connection between the two, you think? Are they related in any way? Yeah, I think there's an obvious connection, which is the subject matter, the, the human being. Um, so I think that what Kant calls the central question of philosophy, what is a human being? And it's, it's three aspects of um, what can I know, what ought I to do, what may I hope for, are very much and should be in the heart of um, any investigation of the psyche. I think that's the, that's the obvious connection. So philosophy and language, uh, philosophy of language and the experience of astonishment are two of your key areas of interest, at least in your earlier work. You also have experience working with children in this context. So what did that teach you about language and astonishment and you know, how has that experience affected your, your work in philosophy? I'm so glad you asked that question because the um, topic of, of children or talk of children um, is something that is really missing in philosophy and I think that's for obvious reasons that have to do with what it has meant to do philosophy and the, who has been doing philosophy um, um, so, so I'm glad to say something about that, to be able to say something about that. I can't, I can't think of any particular ways um, in which it has like to give you particular propositions but um, I think it does, um, it does make you more sensitive to the complexity of what it means to be in the world. Because, you know, in philosophy, we tend to draw these very clear cut distinctions between the emotional life and the life of the mind, so thinking, rationality, and then you have the body and bodily sensations, and then you have how do all these things relate to others. But I think when you are looking at a child and their main way of being in the world, which, uh, for example, let's take the, the case of playing, um, it's, uh, it's impossible to draw these distinctions that are so clear-cut in the case of the adult, uh, because the child, when while playing, the child is thinking, uh, is processing and, and, and um, uh, exploring emotions and is also connecting to others through the body. Um, yeah, so I think it's a way to, um, to, to, to make you more sensitive to that complexity which some, so often is kind of um, lost in, in philosophy. So in some ways, philosophy has focused too much on the adult sort of mode yeah, of being when right? it comes to like thinking of what it is to be a human. Exactly. But, but I, I also think it's important to bring in philosophy when you look at the child. So recently, and I think it may be the, f the first time, definitely one of the few times, I saw um, a remark on children in Kierkegaard's work, The Concept of Anxiety. It's just a small, short uh, brief remark. But what he's saying there, you know, Kierkegaard has this thing that, that uh, human beings are not just um, body and psyche, but they are also spirit. And, and he sees anxiety in children, uh, which, which he um, uh, discusses as their uh, attraction to the enigmatic and the monstrous as a sign of, of spirit in children. So how the child is already a case of the human being that we then focus on in Heideggerian terms, the design, right? 
And I thought that was beautiful. Astonishment is, is also a kind of weird philosophical topic one that not many people work on. Is that also a more uh, an experience that is more akin to kind of being a child and being sort of discovering the world? What sort of drew you to, to study this it didn't, somewhat neglected kind of... Yeah, I mean, you're right that certain kinds of astonishment do. Um, perhaps in its roots too, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about that in relation to children. But um, my interest in astonishment was uh, um, my entry point to a discussion about the limits of language. And so I was interested in a particular kind of wonder that I called astonishment. We could also call extreme wonder, where that links to a difficulty of expression in language. So you, or ordinarily, when we speak of wonder, we uh, think of things that are unusual, curious, rare, novelties, and, and there you don't really have a difficulty of expression because if you ask me, what is your wonder about? And I say to you, well, I just found out about the quantum world and all this time I've been living in the Newtonian world. Uh, that's, that, that, that satisfies you and me in terms of what is it. But when it comes to the examples I have in mind, like, for example, um, something that Wittgenstein mentions, the wonder at the existence of the world, that anything exists in the first place, you kind of knew that already. You knew that yesterday and the day before and a few years ago. So why does this suddenly take on this uh, astonishing character? And there you may have a problem with, with language and the sense that there is something you can't express. And I, I take a different position. I think expression is possible, but that's my way to say something about that. Do you think all of philosophy is a sort of product of this kind of astonishment, that things that we've taken for granted mm. and we all assume, we suddenly realize mm. their peculiarity or their weirdness or the assumptions that lie behind it? Yeah. I mean, there's this um, phrase in the Theaetetus, right, that uh, philosophy originates in wonder, uh, that Socrates um, says. So I think you're very right that that lies in the origin of philosophy. But of course, there you've got an interesting tension Again, that has to do with what is that wonder? Is it wonder like the wonder we find in science? So is it a kind of aporia that can be solved by uh, looking into things? Or is it a different kind of wonder that doesn't, um, that doesn't connect to answerable questions as uh, wonder does in the case of science? Nature sort of is often something mm. that gives us mm. these kinds of experiences. And your developing an interest in the relationship between humans and nature and the fact that we're kind of increasingly losing a connection with it and mm. how how is that affecting us and you know what has what have we learned from the past year of being sort of maybe trying to reconnect with nature as mm. much as we can by going out in parks and things like that mm. i think one danger always when one um talks about nature is a romanticizing nature. So in some sense, I think nature has always been something that we had to fight against, um, that we had to uh, shape so as to uh, survive. Um, so that was always the case. But I think there's something happening uh, with modernity and more specifically with the not just with technology, but with the spirit of technology and the spirit of capitalism, which is that nature, like all other things, is just reduced to um, what serves our narrow interests. Um, like Heidegger says, it, it becomes the standing reserve, just ready to exploit for, for things, for profit. I mean, apart from the very serious consequences like climate change, uh, we, we all know that, um, I think it has a, a deeper kind of ethical consequence too in terms of losing this um, relation to nature as other and, and um, reducing it to something that serves our interests. And I think that's something important and perhaps with the, I don't know, uh, I mean, that's more of a sociological perhaps question, like perhaps with the pandemic there was a sense that something is lost on that level and need to return to nature as this other. So that, that's, that's kind of moving in a different direction from how some people see it. So some people mm. argue that, well, 
the, the, the problem has been that we see ourselves as separate to nature, and nature is there for us to use and, and kind of instrumentalize, as, as you say. And uh, the solution to that is to remind ourselves somehow that we're also part of nature, that we're, we're also natural beings and we're part of it, and therefore, you know, it, nature isn't this other. But do you think, in fact, the right way to go is, is not to remind ourselves that we're also natural, but to kind of see nature as this kind of other? As you say, I think I think there is a way to respond to this by bringing both the things that you s just um, mentioned as um, are, are, as opposites to bring them in as two sides of the same coin. Because I think that um, reminding ourselves that we are what I, I like to call earthlings, earthly creatures, uh, is a reminder that we are uh, conditioned. And therefore, that things are other to us, um, and that 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 part of what it means to be conditioned, part of what uh, these conditions or this conditioning is, is the otherness of these of these things that we have to respond to. Yeah, we think of language as important in terms of communicating our sort of subjective psychological states, our experiences. And, but at the same time, we're trying to do that through some kind of universal system in which we're trying to describe very particular, very unique types of experiences. Are the narratives that we give through language always true to, to those experiences? Um, I would want to say yes, um, but I would need to... Um, Clarify or, or or make some of the words you mentioned, like the inner and and, and language, um, a bit more complex than we usually tend to think. First of all, perhaps also going back to the case of the child, I think that there is a, a temptation to think of the inner and the outer as uh, to draw a very sharp distinction between the two, and then language becomes this tool of translating what is inner to what then is outer. But what that um, fails to see is that the inner is already intelligible. It is already shaped in a way that makes it uh, intelligible to us and to others. And I'm thinking here of the psychoanalyst Bion, who looks into thinking and what thinking is, and looks into babies and mothers, and how the mother is the thinking for the baby. So that's what she does. She becomes what? maybe philosophy of mind, they would call the extended mind um, of the baby. And through that bond with the baby, she thinks for the baby and makes things intelligible, including itself, including its own body and what the baby is doing for itself and for herself. So I think that's, so I think if we take that into account and if we look at language as more than just a tool for a presentation, then my answer would be yes. Yeah, so so language was already present in the in the yeah. inner. Yeah, and it well, isn't something. first nature, second nature, right? Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. And uh, what sort of projects are you working on currently? Two projects. I'm I'm finishing a book on wonder and anxiety as um, encounters or experiences that can have some kind of existential merit. So that can teach us something about the possibilities of the human being. And I'm also just about to start a project on nature that you mentioned earlier, um, which looks into what, we, what it is that we lose when we replace real nature with man-made copies of nature. And of course, the question that comes straight after what I just said is, is there such thing as real nature? Can we even draw the distinction between real and fake or, or man-made? So that, these are the new projects. You mentioned uh, Theotetus earlier as a mm. dialogue by Plato. Mm. Being, being Greek and being a philosopher, do you find you have like a special connection to the ancient Greek philosophical tradition? Do these texts, uh, are these texts still alive for you? Do you revisit them in your philosophical uh, projects? Mm. I think actually uh, being Greek has done two things. It has impeded my relation to this text <laughs> and enabled my relation to the text. It has enabled it, obviously, through the Greek language. And I feel more and more grateful for the fact that I uh, learned ancient Greek when I was uh, as a child 
And of course, knowing, being a native um, Greek speaker also helps with that. But it has also impeded it in the sense that when something is so close to you, you tend to overlook it. Um, and I think it, it, it took some time for me to go back to what is close uh, to home. And, and I mean, you probably also know that, that I think there's a strange relation between Greece and those, and those texts right now. Um, to, to, to some extent, they are treated more as um, uh, things that you do in philology rather than in, in philosophy. So that's an added uh, difficulty. But God, yeah, I mean, whether they matter and how they matter, I wouldn't know where to start. Uh, I'll just say this, how, how important and moving I find that um, it's not only that you find thoughts that you yourself have struggled with, but that you find thoughts clearly expressed. And I think one of the things that deeply moves me as a philosopher, and probably moves every philosopher, is to see a clear thought, because you know all the work that has been done. And so when sometimes I read Plato or Aristotle, and I find that, just the idea that they have, that someone 2,000 years ago has done all the process that I am struggling with, uh, yeah, that's astonishing. <laughs> do, you, do you have a philosopher that you think your views mostly align with? I mean, to me, it's not so much a matter of views, because that's another discussion, topic of, of discussion, I suppose, whether, whether philosophy is about a theory or about a view, or whether it's about a way of thinking, uh, a method of thinking, perhaps. And when it comes to that, I think the two philosophers I've been most um, influenced by and that kind of speak to me most is Wittgenstein and Heidegger. Wittgenstein because of the almost relentless search for clarity, um, which I really respect and admire. And also his way of looking into looking into a philosophical problem by looking at it rather than by kind of diving in. And Heidegger, because I think he's very sensitive to how our existence is conditioned. Um, and yeah, I, I find him a very deep thinker in relation to, to that. Maria Belasco, thank you very much. Thank you for your lovely questions. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.